the perfection of the mind. And there is a, a hidden, or by some philosophers, an explicit opposition to Descartes, who had an idea that the self is totally transparent to itself. But Gadamer emphasizes that the mind needs itself in order to come to clarity. So you do me a proposal, and shall I do it or not? Uh, I walk around with this. I, there's a nice expression, expression in your language. It's something like um, consulting, consulting my pillow, isn't it? So in, in Dutch, it's a nachtje slapen. I moet have a nachtje op slapen. I, I need to sleep at night to come to clarity to myself. So the mind needs itself uh, to start the process and to come to some kind of clarity or decision. Yeah, uh, so. In fact, uh, there was a nice exhibition of Charlie Chaplin in Rotterdam a few years ago, and I found this, uh, this picture. And also, Charlie is not totally identical to himself, which is very clear, because he had this enormous richness of roles which he played. It's very lovely. So, the dialogue itself is inspired, certainly the notions of dialogue, by Mikhail Bakhtin, the Russian literary scholar, but also by William James. So, what is the overview of the presentation? Um, so, why would we need the dialogue itself? There are more, so many self-conceptions. Why another one? Is there a reason to come with the dialogue itself? Then, quite an intriguing concept for myself, it's more and more and more intriguing over the years, is the notion of contradiction. What, what does it mean, contradiction in the self? Is it a logical or is it a dialogical concept? And the dialogical self involves in time and space. Time, the Kantian yeah, basic categories, time and space, are essential to understand the dialogical self. And is it possible that we develop a self on the basis of contradictions and conflicts? So, finally, summary. <coughs> Yeah, this is uh, the book. Of course, there's always a book. Um, <laughs> I was writing it together with uh, my wife and colleagues, uh, Agnieszka Karman Skamoka. And you see here, uh, it's not the, 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 the cover and the picture, it's not only because my wife, she loves crocodiles, <laughs> but it's also to represent the basic forces in the cell, in the dialogue of the cell. So there are sentry battle forces going to the center and sentry full forces going from the center. Stabilizing forces, destabilizing forces, organizing and disorganizing forces. And both are needed to understand the dialogue itself. Because in the dialogue you are confronted with the otherness of the other. The other is always an altar with an different point of view and somewhere how can we integrate that so somewhere the context of the other person in his difference is a kind of destabilizing force this organizing but at the same time it's possible the dialogue helps us to integrate different points of views and to create new meanings yes let's have a look to start this is to uh, an example given by Mikhail Bakhtin because it's quite illustrative for the notion of space. We go now into the relevance of space to dialogue. So life is good, the one person says, and life is good, the other person repeats. From a logical point of view, there is purely identity. However, from a dialogical point of view, there are two statements coming from the mouths of two spatially located people who are located in different places. So, from a dialogical point of view, the two uh, statements are not identical, but, but different. I think something like sarcasm cannot be understood in a logical way, but it can be understood better in a dialogical way. A person says, life is good. Life is good. So, the intonation 
moves you to the opposite meaning. While logically the term is, is two statements are totally separate. Take life is good and life is not good. Logically, it's a negation, but, but dialogically, it's a disagreement. So, life is good and life is not good, logically contradictory or or, but dialogically, when you look at it from the perspective of positioning and counterpositioning, it's something which is and and. Two different perspectives which seem to exclude each other can be true at the same time. Contradiction, but they belong, they can also um, be true at the same time. Yeah, well this, what keeps me thinking is that uh, dialogue or a particular statement and the other person repeats the same statement um, is the beginning of the process. It's not the end of the kind of syllogism, period. That's the conclusion. But the dialogue is always the beginning. It creates the tension. Uh, life is good. Yes, life is good. The word yes suggests that there is a minimal innovative element. Yeah, what is striking when you look at art, at paintings, is that there is so much attention for contradictions in the 20th century. Um, an example is the Dutch painter, mathematician, Escher, and you could wonder, these people are going up, do they go up? No, at some point, they go down, they go up, and they go down at the same time. It's very contradictory. <laughs> the Belgian uh, painter Magritte is the person standing in front of the mirror. Does he see himself or not? And very well known is this one, ce n'est pas une pipe. So this is not the pipe, and he's right. It's, it's a pipe. To represent a pie, but at the same time it's not a pie because you can think it, you can mm -hmm. Of course, Picasso, is it uh, one face? Is it two faces? Is it a person who is different towards himself, herself? Some painters they create an intimacy of one person with himself by bringing two faces very close to each other. It's from the altar to the ego, and from the ego to the altar. <coughs> yeah, several years ago, the, one of our keynote speakers in, it was at a conference in Warsaw, um, there was a keynote speaker, Peter Calero, and some years before that, I read a fantastic article of him, in the annual review of sociology. And what he did, he took some distance from psychology and he was wondering what are some of the main concepts in psychology, in mainstream psychology, and do we find some similarity between them? These are the concepts. The question I will pose, is this a representative of a modern project. So, modern project in the sense of a typical product of enlightenment. Well, Peter Calero, he comes with a number of conclusions, and I take several conclusions, which I think are significant in order to go to the idea, the spirit of the dialogue itself. There is a tendency in mainstream psychology of the self to focus on stability, unity and conformity, and de-emphasize the sociological principles of social construction. The self that is socially constructed may congeal around a relatively stable set of cultural meanings, but, and that's the point, but these meanings can never be permanent or unchanging. So it's not a kind of trade like a person is consistent or is not consistent. Is self-handicapping or not self-handicapping? is strongly in self-enhancement or low in self-enhancement. Second conclusion. Similarly, the self that is socially constructed 
make a peer centered, unified and singular. <clears throat> but this symbolic structure will be as multidimensional and diverse as the social relationships that surround it. When society becomes more complex, also the self becomes more complex as a part of society. So you see in Peter Canero it's and and stable and changing. It's singular and multidimensional, and and. Finally, very relevant, the self that is socially constructed is never a bounded quality of the individual or simple expression of psychological characteristics. It's a fundamentally social phenomenon where concepts, images, and understandings are deeply determined by relations of power. When these principles are ignored or rejected, the self is often conceptualized as a vessel for storing all the particulars of a person. When I was reading this, I thought, ah, there is this uh, article by um, Edward Samson in the American Psychologist in 1985. And he talks about the self-contained, uses the same term, 